this session is being recorded. <laughs> you know what? That name is actually there. I'll take that. <laughs> <laughs> I'll take that. <laughs> Wait a couple more minutes, see if anyone else joins us. Uh, I know Seg is yeah, he's, a bit late. Mm-hmm. he's the reason I'm doing these things. I told him he's not gonna learn how to score, he doesn't know yeah. how to bar Mexico. I, I did say, yeah, exactly. And he's still on how to go bar Mexico. No, this this is not about how to score. Question: Will will, if, will we cover? Question: you Snipe Selly at any point? I point I tonight? did see that comment, and no, we are not. Oh, can, can we get a Selly guide, Phil? <sighs> what? <laughs> I would be the student in that lecture. I would not be the teacher of a decent Selly. <laughs> find me a style jump into the glass, but break it. <laughs> matter how much I want to do an interesting celly when I score I always end up doing the same thing which is throwing both yeah. arms up and going Woo! Exactly. that's, it. that's I, all I, I do every fucking time and I hate I it I think about stuff and end up doing that because I forget no I'm, I'm just impulsive I go <laughs> to the bow and arrow every time even though I've got plenty up here it's the as soon as I score no, I, boom, I, I, I just get too excited because it's so rare it's like when I was when I was playing for Hamilton, we played a game against the Edinburgh Knights, and in instead of the like the three two one Knights, like you'd expect the club to do, they all put their sticks in the air like swords. Oh, no. And I jo- I jokingly said, if I score a goal this game against them, I'm, my celly is going to be that. That's pretty good. And I fucking scored and didn't do the celly. Oh. And it was only after the match that I realised, oh fuck. That is pretty funny. If you'd done that, oh, that'd be, that'd be great. I can appreciate the shit house it, it would have been, but I just, I just, I was just excited to have scored. I don't do it right now. <laughs> Wait, hold on, actually. I can complete full Andrew Caddy's look. The full Andy oh. Caddy look. By the hoodie. Oh, of course. It has to. <laughs> <laughs> you, you guys anyone been watching the Hawks <laughs> <laughs> I we beat Columbus baby 12 <laughs> look how bad I look in this part oh Jesus that is terrible I like, I like how Preston's American accent is just more Scottish <laughs> hey James I've got a hat for you mm-hmm. oh it's too tight ow <laughs> what is it? Oh, is it a bruise? Oh, what does it say? It's a bruise. How bad that looks. Oh, James, I'll, I'll just eat it down to commentary. Yeah, do it. <laughs> hey, Matt. That's my. Fantastic. I've done nothing today. Yeah, brilliant. Yeah. I already know what you're going to say, which is just uh, that I should stand in front of the net and uh, just cherry pick everything. Just just put your big fat ass in front of the net and just bounce some pucks in. Deep. Right, everyone ready? I like that enthusiasm. <clears throat> so, the agenda for this week, same format as last week. The introduction, which is more or less the same as last week, but I'll go through it very briefly for those who weren't here last week. Um, hopefully, we can keep it under two hours this week. So. Uh, and then offensive tactics, we'll go through some individual things and then some more team orientated tactics. I'll say again, uh, well, then there's conclusion and then people are welcome to ask questions throughout. But if you have a question that you for a slide that was like 10 slides back, then just wait till the end and then ask then. Um, 
I said this last week, a lot of this stuff is going to be very basic. So for more experienced players, they're probably going to go, well, duh. Um, but this is to make sure that everyone is at the same baseline to start with. And because a lot of us know these things already, but we just didn't do them in games. So that's why we're doing it. So once again, the purpose is to prep next cup season, which will be 21-22. We haven't got any ice sessions, so this is part of the continued club engagement. If we've got nationals this year, fantastic. And we'll try and implement some of these in matches if we do over the summer, but probably not. Um, the Bradford game, from an offensive side, we were very one-dimensional. We didn't we we did the same thing, but we did it well. So we came out winning, which was fine, but there wasn't much structure to our attack. Uh, there were a lot of passes we could have made that we didn't. A lot of open space that we didn't utilize and uh, most of it's down to an experience and us being a new team but it's that's why i'm having this chat now uh the northumbria game again our our lack of um creativity and options in attack really stifled us against northumbria and as they were a lot more organized than bradford were they were able to shut us down quite a bit more convincingly also, at the end of the presentation, there's an example of one of the goals that Northumbria scored, which perfectly exemplifies some of the team tactics that I'll be discussing as well. So it's also relevant. The Beagles game, again, it's a lot of inexperienced players in that game. But again, offensively, we didn't have many, we didn't use many tools in order to try and create space and score goals. And so at the moment, although we are scoring goals, we're quite an easy team to shut down on most games. And if the, if the opposing team has any sort of defensive organization, if we continue the way we are, we're going to be very easy to shut down in the future. And again, same as last week, a lot of rec coaches or rec teams don't explicitly tell people these things. These are things that you either pick up or you have to go away and learn yourself. So I just wanted to share some of it with all of you. Oops, um, how do I go back? So club organization. So this is for the people who weren't here last week. So the way the BOHA works is that players can play up a team, but they can't play down. So if you're registered for the A team, you can only play for the A team. You can't play a game for the B team or the C team. You have to only play for the A team. So what most clubs do is they will pick, they will register the minimum amount of players they can for the A team and put everyone else in the lower teams so that they can play a couple of games up. And if you play your third game up, then you then your registration then moves to the higher team. So it means at the start of next season, if we field two teams, for example, I'll be selecting 11 skaters and one goalie to be in the A team. And that'll be straight off the bat. And then I'll be rotating B team players in as I see fit and as they gain experience. Um, so a lot of effort in the first practice back whenever that's going to be, because in the new season, I'm going to be picking 12 people to go into the A team straight off and everyone else will be filtered down into the lower teams for the cups. Um, that of course changes at nationals where you're not allowed to play up or down. Um, but that comes in a separate team selection later on. Basics, so goalie, two defenders, two forwards, five skaters, everyone attacks, everyone defends, no restrictions on movement on the ice, basic tactics here closely. So the picture is if you were to teach beginners hockey, which we have been doing it at our club, you tell them this basic formation and then in, in attack and defense, they will always just use that formation because it's a nice, easy way to recognize where you're going to be playing. When we start doing more attack orientated drills, particularly with team tactics, and you'll see in an example later on, the line between forward and defender while attacking is going to be much more blurred. So we're going to have situations where defenders are going to be pinching or over overlapping forwards and forwards are going to have to take up defensive positions. So it's important that everyone knows everything from last week and everything from this week, because you're going to find yourself in, in situations that you're not exclusively trained for. 
and a lot of teams focus on all forwards learning how to attack, all defenders learning how to defend, and then a line down the middle and no one does anything else other than that. And it's big bugbear for me. Uh, yep, good for beginners, but a good foundation to build advanced plays on. Phil's Osfi. Uh, time, time to take action. This, this is something I, I really want to hammer home is that particularly when you're attacking, a defending team has to decide what it is you're going to do or recognize what it is that you're trying to, to achieve on attack and then react accordingly in a correct manner to that. So if you can practice and essentially automate your, your attacking strategies, you can move and act a lot quicker than they can recognize and then react to what you're doing. And that gives you that split second advantage over them when it comes to chasing after a puck, for example. Um, dump and chase is a good example. Um, a lot of teams at our level don't employ that sort of tactic. So if we were to suddenly do a well-orchestrated dump and chase, we would catch most of their team on in off guard. And so it'd be easier to overtake and then successfully implement that tactic as opposed to just chucking it in the corner and just leaving it for the other team. Um, re repetition of the drills helps reduce the decision time on our side. So if you automate these offensive drills and you know certain signals in order to ac activate them essentially, excuse me, then it becomes a lot quicker for you to do it. So if you see that player skating in that position or that player has done this with the puck, right, that means we, he's going to, they're going to try and attempt this particular play. I can slot in here or I can do this or I can do that. We have, if we know where we're all going to be, it makes life a lot easier when it comes to passing and opening up options. And one thing in this, offen in this offensive tactics, I'm not going to be talking about shooting at all. Sorry for the snipers. There's nothing about, about shooting in here. Shooting isn't a big issue. The issue is getting the puck to the net in the first place. And that's what this is about. This is going to be focused more on passing and movement than it is on shooting. Muscle memory helps reduce reaction time. So if you similarly, if you get used to doing certain things, particularly as a defender, if you get used to practicing having to defend against the dump and chase, then when it happens in a game, your brain is going to automatically switch to that and you're going to feel a lot more comfortable reacting to that particular strategy. Trust your teammates. Everyone needs to know, needs to be able to trust each other. If you need to trust the goalie to make the save, the goalie needs to trust you to cut off the pass if it's two on one. And that's the clearest example I can give. But wingers, when defending, they need to be confident that their defenders and their center have got that. And they just need to cover the blue line players. Similarly, the defenders need to trust that the wingers are going to cover any defensemen who are on the blue line waiting for long shots. If you don't, then players start moving out of position, you get mismatches, and then you end up conceding. Hockey is about creating options, particularly in uh, offense, and you're going to hear me say it a lot today, cr uh, about creating the number of passing options or shooting options that you have. The more options that you have, the more the defending team has to consider when they're trying to defend against you. So if the player is just skating at them, they can defend that. The player's only going to do one thing. If the player is skating at them, he's got another player overlapping on the outside. They've got another player coming down the other side, another player skating behind them. They've got three other options they've then got to consider. So they can't just dive in on the player with the puck because they might just go around them or they might just pass it to the next person who then goes flying past. So... The more options you have offensively, the harder it becomes for a defending team to react and recognize what it is you're going to do. Um, it also, also with options, it also means that if your well drilled out plan isn't working out, you have other options to move to. So if the dump and chase isn't working or the overlap pass isn't on, you can pop it across the blue line to a defender who can one time it or whatever. It's, it's about options. The more options you have, the easier life is. Uh, hard work beats talent. So I'd much rather have five mediocre people who skate like hell on every single shift than five talented people who just meander around the halfway line waiting for a pass to pop out. It's Teamwork beats individualism, same sort of thing. 
Uh, one thing I've said this last week again, this is for people who weren't here last week. Um, in training, when it comes to doing certain dr open ended drills, there's going to be a 30 second time limit to simulate a very short shift, which, well, what is the average shift time for most NHL players? So, in an open ended drill, you're going to be given 30 seconds to make something happen. And if you don't, then I'll call it. It's we're going to get used to doing shorter, quicker shifts um, so that we can keep the intensity as high as possible. So it's a series of 30 second sprints continually throughout the periods. None of this three minute shifts until we're all gasping for air at the end. Uh, another thing, and this is this wasn't in last week's one that I'm going to be doing, particularly uh, for offensive drills. <laughs> I'm going to be stopping play occasionally, or I'm going to be coming up to you after the play, and I'm going to ask, why did you do this? So why did you pass down the boards? Why did you decide to try and dangle four players instead of passing to the player in front of the net? I'm going to ask you, and you need to be able to think about, and you need to ask yourself these questions when you're doing this so that you can understand what it is we're doing. We get, offensively, we're going to be a very direct and purposeful team. So there's not going to be any, oh, I just chucked the puck over there because it was clear and there was no one in the opponent's jersey in that corner. It's going to be, I put it in that corner because I saw one of my wingers flying down the boards and they were going to get to it. Perfect. That's great. But you need to think about this while you're doing it. If you can't come up with a good answer, I might make you do laps. So the statistics, same from last time, um, all about the danger zones. So the first stat, there um, regarding the slot, 59% of five on five goals. So last week we were saying, you wanna keep the puck out of that area. So as attackers, where do you think we want the puck to go? Anyone feel free to answer. In that area. Well done, yes. Yeah. We're gonna <laughs> want to try and get the puck into the center zone. <laughs> We want the puck in the higher percentage areas because it gives us more of a chance to put a cleaner, better shot on target. There's no point in us being right on the goal line against the boards trying to get shots in there because although you might get one or two, you're not going to get the percentage of them, the majority of them. You want the puck in the high percentage areas. That way it's a lot easier just to get the puck on there. And as long as the puck is in that area, their goaltender is going to feel threatened. Their defenders are going to feel threatened. It increases the stress levels of a defending team. And even if you don't score, if the puck stays in that area for two solid minutes during, say, for example, a penalty kill, that's exhausting from a mental perspective as well as a physical. It's As a defender, it is horrible having the puck bouncing around in your own slot for two minutes at a time. And so the longer you can keep the puck in there, the more chances that are going to be there. The second statistic, and this is where the shooting side comes in, 71% of all goals are scored in the bottom one foot of the net. Gibby, this is why I keep telling you goaltenders, you need to cover the ice. You need to make sure the pucks don't go in on the ice, because if you can cover that, that's half the battle at our level in particular, because a lot of shots go that low. I know sometimes it doesn't feel like it, but as I've seen, this was taken from North American high school and college hockey. And I know for a fact the stats are pretty similar in NHL as well. And most goals are scored in the bottom one foot of the net. So that's leg pad gone flat on the ice and a couple of inches above that. So this is saying from an attacking side, I'm not too concerned about people's shooting ability. I'm not hugely concerned if you can't lift the puck. When it comes to playing, particularly at our level, that's not the end of the world. I, I don't think I've ever scored a goal in BOIHA where the puck has come off the ice, because goaltenders are weakest when you move them laterally. When you have to, when they have to move side to side across the face of the goal, and when that happens, it doesn't actually matter whether the puck's in the top of the top shelf or if it's along the bottom of the ice. They're just as vulnerable in both situations. Um, so I'm not too concerned about that because you can you can pass you can move the puck around what a, a, 
a half decent shot can do. Shots, it's if you can shoot, great. And obviously, we're going to be practicing shooting. But if you're one of the 11 skaters selected in the A team, we're not going to be doing skate uh, shooting drills. The focus isn't going to be trying to hit top shelf every single shot. The focus is just getting the puck in the back of the net. I don't care how it gets there. And the plays that lead up to that point. Um, 80% of all goal score with little to no wind up. So this again sort of comes back to quality of the shots. You have these people who do wonderful dangles and then the wrist shots that take an age or the slap shots where the sticks come all the way up here and then come all the way back down. If you get a quick snapshot off, the goalie finds it harder because they have to work on reactions alone. So just get the fucking shot off. It's again, this, this whole presentation isn't focused on shooting and how to shoot better. It's how to get yourself in a, posi a better position to shoot, irregardless of the quality of the shot. Gibby, that one's for you. Oh, he's not there. Cover your five hole, man. Uh, 56% of goals come from rebounds or deflections. Now, some of the offensive strategies we're going to be looking at aid in this particular statistic, but it just goes to show that the majority of goals scored, and this is taken from the top Finnish league, so not quite NHL, but still damn high quality. It doesn't matter if it's a dirty goal, because most of them actually are. Most of them are horrible pinball bounces that come flying off skates and legs and heads in some humorous cases. So again, this, this isn't about the quality of the puck going in the net. It's about getting the bloody thing in the net because that's what wins games. So any questions before we get on with the actual individual stuff? Love the referencing. I don't know what that means. I don't know what you're referring to, Matthew. You can unmute, you know. Does anyone have any questions for a carry on? No, yes, no, no. I'll take the silence as a no. <sighs> Charm aside there. Right. Okay, so. Mutes off so you can answer the questions. What is the purpose of offense in ice hockey? And indeed, most invasion sports. To, to score genos. To go bar, Maxi. <laughs> score goals. Well done. Uh, and therefore, Selly. <laughs> and therefore, Selly. Well, <laughs> I, I didn't have that on the list, unfortunately. But um, So what other things do we want to try and achieve on a... Obviously, the end end goal is to score a goal, but what else do we want to try and achieve throughout a match and throughout plays using our offensive strategies? Keep possession. Yeah. Sorry, what was what was that? Paul first. Uh, keep possession. Yeah, keep possession. Um, yeah, that's what I was going to say. Tire them out. Yeah. Yeah, cr just create pressure. So look, create space is the most important one I've got on here. Um, Sorry to interrupt. I don't know. I don't know which one comes up next because I've put the order in a particular way. So it's buggered. But yes, both of those are good points. Um, you want to try and create space. Mm -hmm. um, if you if you have more space when you have the puck, you have more time to look around and assess the options that you have. It might be half a second, but half a second is actually quite a long time when you're panicking with a puck in your stick. Uh, what else have we got? Waste time. It's a good way to waste time, uh, particularly if you're on a penalty kill or something like that. So you might not always just want to try and get the puck to the net because if you're outnumbered five to four or five to three, the chance of you getting a goal and then being, if they're set up defensively, might not be that good. However, if you just dump the puck and pin them to the boards for two minutes and waste time, that's, again, that's a, a, a good offensive strategy to be using. Confuse and wear down opponents. Um, sort of goes back to what I was saying earlier. It's it's fucking stressful being 
in your own zone defending for an extended period of time. And uh, it's it, it, the mental side of it does wear on you a bit. And particularly when you start using things like crash the net or getting the puck behind the net, it's very easy to start confusing players, particularly less experienced ones, which more commonly what we'll be playing against. Options again, this sort of comes on from the creating space, creating passing options. So not necessarily just in front of you, but side to side, behind you, everywhere. It's all about creating options to frustrate and intimidate. Now, I, I keep referencing the dump and chase because it's such a good strategy. I love it. Um, but it is a great way to intimidate both in checking and non-checking. And we'll go more into detail that later. And to frustrate players, it's, again, if you can't get the puck off the, off the opposing team because they're passing it around so well and you can't touch the puck, it's very frustrating. And it'll force them into taking penalties. It'll force them to making additional mistakes. That's what you want. So individual plays. We've got lateral and linear passes, which is passing side to side or passing forwards and backwards. Quick turns or sudden stops. Drop pass or a blind pass. That I know they're not strictly exactly the same things, but there is some crossover, so I put them together. Fake shots and shot passes. Source passes. Stick handling. Using the body. And that's it. So lateral and linear passes first. Uh, lateral is passing from side to side. This is something that in our matches we were very good at. We were actually able surprisingly good at this this is something that some teams struggle with when it comes to passing the puck around but when moving an attack we were having quite a lot of success with that linear passes or whatever you want to call them passing forwards and backwards was something we struggled more with there were a number of times in our matches uh particularly in the bradford game a little less so in the northumbria game um where we had defenders or wingers who were completely available near the back and the player with the puck completely ignored them and was more focused on just getting the puck into the slot. Sometimes getting the puck into the slot isn't the best option if there's one of our players and four of theirs there. Sometimes it's best to get it back to the defender or to the winger, who whoever's out with a bit of space, reassess and then try and attack from a different angle, maybe draw some of the players out. Um, something we can we're definitely going to work on but it was something that we didn't do during uh the bradford game in particular uh lateral passing forces goalies to move thus creating shooting opportunity again this is forcing the goalies to move laterally obviously stick handling and the famous triple deke is a great way to get your goalie moving side to side as you find in all the mighty ducks films um but passing it makes the goalie move of course one time a shots that that's a lateral pass Linear pass offers more attacking options. So, again, if this is more about taking your time and not rushing it. You don't always have to get the puck straight to the slot as quickly as possible. Sometimes pass it back out, move the puck around a bit, see if there's another opening to use. Uh, quick turns and sudden stops. So, I do this... When we do skating drills, particularly around cones, I get us to do a lot of tight turns. Uh, and obviously with suicides and that, we do a lot of sudden stops at high speeds as well. Part of the reasoning for that is for plays like this. Um, as we discussed last week, a defender in a one-on-one -on -one situation will always, should always use gap control, should always have the player in front of them, should always be about a stick, a stick and a half lengths apart trying to stop the player from getting past them. If the attacking player suddenly stops, or as shown in this diagram at the bottom with the right winger, I've allocated here, it doesn't really matter. They do a, a quick, quick turn here. The defender has to react to that. And in the second it takes for them to react, you've gained yourself an extra meter or so if you're both skating at a pretty fast pace. That gives you more space to then pass off or even to shoot sometimes. And you'll watch this in the NHL over and over again. You'll see players skate with the puck into the zone. There's nothing on. So they do a quick turn. And before they know it, three of their players have crossed the, line, the blue line at speed and they've got passive options to use. So in this diagram here, the player can 
quickly pop it off to the defender who's going out on the wing. You can pass it across to the other defender who's on the blue line to get it into the centre. Or just chuck it on net where the centre and the left winger have now dived straight into the net. Um, this is something that's very useful um, against defenders with good gap control. Because if they don't react fast enough, then they give you too much space. And one of the things with gap control is you don't want to give the event the attacking player too much space. If you do that, they can then bring the puck into the center of the ice or they can go around. They have much more space to play with and a lot more options. Used to allow teammates to catch up to the play. So you can have occasions where you've, for some reason, a puck carrier has gone across and they're now up against two defenders. No offense, but a lot of us are not going to be getting going to be able to dangle past two defenders and then get a shot on goal. So this sort of thing not only gives you space, it allows the rest of your team to catch up. And then, as shown in the diagram, you've got more passing options. Uh, can be part of uh, multi-phase play. So this is this was more me just sort of rambling. So again, right wing does a quick pivot, does a quick blind pass off to the defender who's coming down the wing that player that can then laterally pass it to the center or into the goal and all sorts of other wonderful tactics as such that was just me being a bit creative i suppose uh again and gives a puck carrier more options if you're skating into the zone by yourself and there's one defender in front of you you've essentially got one ish option which is to skate with the puck you could do other things but they're not really going to be very purposeful in this. If you stop, suddenly stop or pivot quickly with the puck, then you have all these passing options available as the other, as the rest of the team catches up to play. It also takes, particularly at our level, takes some players by surprise as well because they don't expect a player to not skate towards the net. It can really throw some players off when, when the attacking team isn't just trying to dive everyone on the net at the same time. But that's what you want to do. Drop pass and a blind pass. So drop pass, dropping the puck to the player behind you. Blind pass is passing without looking or intentionally looking one direction and passing in another direction. Or in this particular case, he of the picture in the bottom, he basically did another drop pass into the slot. Uh, both passes are great for creating space for the receiving player. So if the opposing team think that the puck carrier is going to pass in one direction and they end up passing in a different direction, that split second of surprise is going to give the receiving player that little extra time and space to do something with it because they're not going to expect it. And it can be incredibly effective, especially at our level. Uh, drop pass is great for then setting up a screen. If the player doing skating into the zone drops the puck behind them and then skates hard to the net, they can turn around to try and get the deflecting shot or just screen the goalie. Um, and then the other pl the player receiving the puck can then just take a one-timer straight off the drop pass. It's a simple strategy, but it is effective. Uh, blind pass is a great deception, particularly at our level. A lot of a lot of people expect the pass to come off the forehand as well. So the blind pass could just be you're looking over here and you just back pass it behind you almost. It's, again, very simple, but we, don't, we didn't do these things and these opportunities were there during our matches. <clears throat> Fake shots and shot passes. Um, both great deceptions that force defense to re-react. So they think you're doing one thing, but actually you're doing something else. And that extra time, again, gives you more space and thus options to use. Fake shots may encourage opponents to flinch or attempt to block. The first one is probably a bit more likely. Um, a lot of people, particularly beginners, are afraid of slap shots. And they will flinch and sometimes try and get out of the way. So even just raising your stick to a slap shot can force players to move position, opening up additional passing options. Um, shot passes are, for all intensive purposes, they look like missed shots, but you'll be surprised how many, they do it quite a bit in the NHL. They look like they've missed the net by about a foot, foot and a half. 
only for it to then bounce off the stick of one of their players and go into the net. That's an intentional pass. That's a shot pass. People think that it's just a crap shot that another player's taken opportunity. A lot of the time, it is actually a pass. Uh, and at our, our particular levels, so, well, at most levels that I've played at, but also most in BOHA, defending teams have a habit of watching shots. So if someone takes a shot, you'll notice a lot of a lot of less experienced players will almost stop what they're doing to watch the puck go to the goal, wait to see if the goalie saves it, and then react. So a, a shot pass is a great way of using that to your advantage. Because if people stop to wait for the puck to reach the goalie, and the puck actually goes to one of your players in the slot, and then bam, they've got a split second advantage over all the defending players who are suddenly going, oh shit, the goalie didn't stop it. It's not even gone on net. Ah, fuck. And then they've got to respond. Um, I, I used to be really bad at doing that, just watching shots. But it does happen a lot. And it's a habit you want to try and get yourself out of because it does give the attacking team that split second to react quicker than you on picking up rebounds. It's a good example. Shot pass can be used to exploit passing lanes near the net. So sometimes it might not look like a shot a pass is on right to a player next to the goal or in the slot. But if you thump it really hard and people think it's a shot going in that direction, then they might not consider covering that passing lane quite so well. So it's, again, particularly at our levels, it's a good way to exploit that. <clears throat> Source of passes. Um, that picture of source was because I thought I was being funny. But we are. Carry on. Uh, it's essentially passing the puck off the ice for those who aren't entirely sure. The puck spins in the air like a flying saucer when it is done properly. It looks very nice, but it's very rarely done very properly, particularly at our level. It's great for passing over obstructions like sticks, bodies, uh, goalie leg pads sometimes if they're completely out of position. Um, it's something we will be, this is an individual skill that a lot of people find quite difficult. So we will be doing drills to practice this once we get back on the ice. Um, it's good for passing in high traffic areas. So if you're passing into the slots, um, it's good. There's a lot of skates, there's a lot of sticks in there. If you can pinpoint where you want, who you want the puck to go to and sorcer it, right and onto their stick then you can avoid all the obstacles and it's i'd argue it's probably harder to do it in the nhl video games than it is in real life but it's a it's an effect, effective pass that a lot of people don't use uh stick handling now i don't feel fully comfortable talking too much about stick handling because i i'm not very good at stick handling i've always been a defensive defender who's always wanted to keep the puck on my forehand and then get rid of it as quickly and as accurately as possible. So I'm just going to give the basics. Uh, it's good for one-on-one -on -one situations, or if you're particularly good, it's good for one-on-five situations. Um, it's used to gain space with the puck. So obviously it's not just about trying to dangle it around players. It's about keeping the puck away from people as well. Uh, it can be used as a deception. You can use it to dummy one way, only to go another way. Uh, toe drags are very useful, which is what this this crap little diagram at the bottom here was me trying to do. A very basic stick handling move is essentially you toe drag it back and then you bring it across the front of you. When you're on a one-on-one -on -one situation, that is a very basic way of getting the puck from one, one side of, of the defender's stick to the other. Um, that's about the extent of my stick handling skills to be honest is that one move so if i'm ever on a one-on-one -on -one with anyone you know exactly what i'm gonna do okay see you later matt um, it's only really limited by your imagination and skill level so you can do all sorts of crazy shit you could do the lacrosse moves or whatever it is the weird stuff Again, I, I'm not nearly experienced enough with this sort of stuff to really tell anyone how to stick handle. 
Um, but it's easy to practice if you've got a smooth surface at home or you've got a golf ball or a hockey ball or a green biscuit. It's easy to practice these things at home. Um, and it's, it's good fun as well. So if you're ever wanting to itch that, scratch that hockey itch that you're having, pick up a golf ball or a green biscuit and start stick handling around your house. And if you have a dog, great, because they love chasing it. It's good fun. Uh, using the body. Now, three things here. Uh, the first one is for puck retention, which is good to counter stick checks. Last week, from a defensive side, we were saying a good way to put off an attacker is to constantly hit their stick while they're trying to stick handle. It becomes a lot harder to stick handle if someone keeps hitting your stick. A good way to then counter that is to then get your body in the way of the defending player so that they have to try and reach around you to try and get the puck or to hit your stick. So it's an effective way of protecting the puck using your body, uh, putting your body between the puck and the opponent. Um, doesn't matter if it's checking or non-checking, the player with the puck is allowed to use their body to keep people away from the puck. It's completely legal. So don't be afraid to use your body in that sense. Uh, Screening to block the goalie view. Um, if you've got a giant center, like a, a Joe Thornton type guy, it can never hurt to just stick them right in the middle, right in front of the goalie and shoot from the point or the blue line for those who don't know what that means. Um, screening the goalie is, can be very effective because if a goalie can see a shot coming, they have a chance of saving it. If they don't see the shot coming, then obviously they have a, a much less chance of stopping the puck. And a lot of it will come down to luck and muscle memory in a lot of senses. Um, so a lot of strategies and a lot of drills that we will be doing will involve at least one player getting in the goalie's way. And going back to the defending presentation last week, we were talking about uh, clearing the area in front of the net. This is the opposite. This is offensively we want to try and choke up in front of the net so that the goalie can't see anything and the harder you are to move and the more defenders it takes to try and move you the better because then you essentially set up a wall um alternatively and this is i've been hard pressed to find an actual example in ice hockey but it's something you could potentially use which is essentially putting your body in the way to obstruct another player getting past you. Now, if you're not careful, well, the example I've got in the picture at the bottom is obviously from basketball because it's used very commonly there. So the number 13 player there is standing in the way of the defender who's marking the ball carrier. So the ball carrier can then just run off, gain a little bit of space so he can shoot, pass, whatever. A similar principle could be used theoretically in ice hockey. So I wanted to include it so that people were aware it's an option. It wouldn't technically be interference if the player setting the pick isn't moving because then they are just defending their spot on the ice. So it would essentially be the other player runs into them. So it's not interference because he wasn't, doing anything he was just standing there and someone else tried to move him and he he or she didn't want to move so it's i'll have to get clarification on how that would actually work but it was just something i wanted to throw in there to get people's imaginations going pick allows players to get space away from whoever's barking them uh so that's the end of the individual things uh these are the team tactics do we want to have a what's time we want to have a quick break, quick toilet stop, and then we'll get back to it in five. Yeah, that sounds good. Okay, cool. Sorry? Obviously, I was thinking of the Bakers game. That would have been a game we would have been really, we could have really put them into pressure. Yeah, well, if I'd been on the bench for the Bradford, I probably would have suggested it for that, just so we could hit that number eight a couple of times. <laughs> you really don't yeah. like that guy, do you? 
he's got. I I just dislike players who have ninety five percent of the team's entire goals, and then the second they get shut down, their team is completely fucking hopeless. It's. I would have took him out at least once. Plus, he was a bit of a dick. Maybe twice soon. Uh, so... <laughs> okay, everyone back. Let us know if you're not back. It's good. I'm alive. Okay, so we're moving on to team tactics now, or team strategies, plays, whatever you want to call them. Uh, the first one and the most basic is triangle. Uh, I think I've screamed this at every forward when they've been doing three on twos or three on ones or three on O's. Is you want to form a triangle when there's three of you. And if there's four of you, you want to form a square, which is two triangles. And if there's five of you, then you want to add another triangle. It's, it's all about giving yourself as many passing options as possible. Um, and thus giving you as many options as possible. So it's it's an important place to be. It's also harder to defend because if you're all standing in one line, a defender only has to get in the way of one passing lane, essentially. Whereas if they're, you're in a triangle, you've got one player trying to mark two passing lanes. It becomes trickier. Three players form a triangle, but as I said, four and five, it all works. And you'll look later when we get into some of the formations that when setting up in the offensive zone, they're all just a series of triangles. Uh, it's basic form of attacking in most invasion sports. So if you've ever played football, basketball, anything like that, it's exactly the same. You will always be encouraged at lower, lower basic levels to form triangles. Pass and go, which is this little diagram on the right hand side is like a two player triangle, but you're still forming a triangle. A pass and go against the boards theoretically is a one person triangle where the boards acts as the passer it's all these things they all form triangles and if you can start seeing things as triangles or multiple passing lanes then it makes it easier for you to assess where you need to be on the ice so if you're not entirely sure where you need to be look where your teammates are and line up so that you've got a decent passing lane to each of them and that's a pretty good start, particularly when attacking. In defending, obviously not so much. You want to be focusing more on what the other team are doing. But when you're attacking or if you're in the neutral zone with the puck, you want to get yourself into a position where if, if you're unsure of what you're meant to be doing, getting in a position where everyone can essentially see you clearly and you can, you've got a straight line past them as well. Uh, dump and chase, as I've discussed a number of times, High intensity, so it's a favourite. It will be a favourite of Ollie. Um, scary in both checking and non-checking. Um, I said this last week, but as a defender, one of the scariest positions you can be in is going into the into your own corner to get the puck with your back to the play, and you know you've got at least one opposing player bearing down on you. In checking, it's absolutely terrifying because nine times out of ten, particularly in Div 2, regardless of which way you're facing, they're going to put you in the boards if they catch you. Um, in non-checking, still scary because you don't want to fuck up and give the puck away, but it's a very easy way to do it. Very easy to make a mistake and mess up. Um, as you can see in the diagram at the bottom, they've got the def one of the defending attackers, one of the defenders from the attacking team dumping the puck in, but it can be anyone to dump it in once they get over the halfway line. What happens if they try and dump it before they go over the halfway line? Icing. Yes, icing. So none of that, please. And if you do that during a scrimmage in training, there will be press-ups. Um, you also want to be careful of not catching your, your players offside. This is a, the key to a good dump and chase is timing. You want to get the puck to cross the blue line first but as soon as the puck is over the blue line, you want your chasing players going over the blue line at speed as well. So obviously doing, doing this in practice and drilling it again and again can be a bit boring sometimes, but when it comes to a game, you'll have the time, 
timing done right so that when you dump the puck, you've got one or two or however many players we want chasing it down at full pelt and catching the other team off, off, off guard. Attacking team then chases the dump using physical board play. This is both in, in checking and non-checking. In non-checking, you're perfectly entitled to pin people against the boards, push them out the way. You're just not allowed to bury them through the glass. So again, it's, it, it, if used properly, it can be, can be a very aggressive and physical strategy. And my preferred way of using it would be to physically dominate the, the players along the boards as we chase it. Element surprise is helpful due to the decision and the reaction times of the defending team. If they're not used to defending a dump and chase strategy, then they're going to be a bit weird. The common thing with this particular diagram at the bottom, the player dumps it into one corner and it wraps around to the other corner. It's quite a common thing to do with a dump and chase. Sometimes you can just bury it into that corner or other times you can wrap it around. If it does wrap around, that confuses a lot of less experienced teams because the first defender will try and go and get the puck and then chase it around the back of the net while at the same time the other defender will try and go to the corner to get it as well and you've got two defenders completely out of position already so if your chasers can catch up get the puck and then pass it back out you're already at an advantage one of the scariest places for a defender is in his own corner with back to the play he's terrifying particularly in checking Great intimidation factor um, due to the physicality when used in particular ways. It doesn't always have to be particularly aggressive and physical, but it can be a great way to really intimidate another team. If you're showing that when it comes to fighting along the boards, you're not going to take anything. You're going to kick the shit out of them, as it were. It's going to make them think twice. Over, if you do it consistently, they'll start to think twice about going into board 50-50s uh, along the boards. Practice enables additional plays to be added once the puck is retrieved. So a lot of the, the key to uh, dump and chase is the chase. Um, it's all about speed, pressure, and aggression. If you are not chasing after the puck hard and fast, you're going to lose the puck. That's that. It's it's a high risk, high reward strategy. So you essentially give up temporary possession of the puck in order to try and regain it in a better position. Um, similar to an up and up, up and uh, up there, up and under in rugby. You kick the ball up and you chase after it. It's a similar sort of strategy. You're sacrificing temporary possession in order to get a better position on the field or the ice or whatever. Um, and if you don't chase it down, then you just you'll simply lose the puck, and it's just a waste of play. Um, you have to commit to it once you know you're going to be doing it. Crash the net. Um, don't know why Otter, Otter was in there. They're not going to put the puck in the back of the net. Um, puck carrier and other forwards all skate at the net. This is a a very basic but very effective strategy where. Basically, everyone just bundles into the net. Uh, passing options close to the net can cause indecision in defenders and the goalie. So if you've got three players all skating in a rough triangle at the goalie, the goalie might get a bit scared with three people fully padded up skating full tilt towards them. But also, they've got to worry about quick passes between the players as well. Um, Causes chaos in front of the net can be tricky to defend against if the defenders aren't switched on and willing to try and push people out of the way. Um, it's a good way to quickly outnumber play it, def the defenders in directly in front of net and uh, great for picking up rebounds as well. Um, it's Again, it can come back to the shot, to shot watching of defenders, but if the first player let's say the, the left winger in the diagram takes a shot from where they are and the other two have crashed the net. They're crashing the net with the expectation that the puck's not going to go in the net. The puck's going to rebound off the goalie and they're going to get their sticks in first. Meanwhile, the defending team will, not all the time, experienced players won't do this, but in less experienced cases, they will essentially wait 
for the goalie to make the save before then trying to react. So it's all about, again, it's back down to the decision-making and the reaction times. If the attacking players are crashing the net with the expectation they're going to get the rebound, then in the majority of cases, they are going to have a slight split-second advantage over the defending team who have to try and react to what's happening. Weaving and cross-ice passing. Now, I mentioned cross-ice passing several times last week, and that's what the diagram on the right is. Essentially, it's single pass, cross the ice, up the ice, which is great for splitting defenders and moving them out of position. Uh, we've, we've done it in drills. I would love one day to see one of my forward lines trying to do it in an actual match because it would confuse the fuck out of anyone in BOHA tiers four, five, and six if you did it. Um, good for practicing passing and moving. Um, you can adapt it to form other neutral zone passing play. So what I want to do is I, I would like us to do this drill quite regularly, get used to it, and then forward groupings as they get more comfortable with each other they start to devise fun little passing patterns they can try themselves, which they might find more effective, or just a different way of trying to break into the into the opponent's defend, defensive zone. Uh, but it's a great start for passing and moving. And as I said, if just, just one line of forwards, just please try and do a three-player weave in the neutral zone, just to make me happy one game. It would just be nice to see. Cross-ice pass, a single pass, cross-ice to open up the defence. Good example last week was James's goal for, against Northumbria, and Northumbria also used it against us, as I will show you in the example later on. Um, Lewis's pass to James is essentially what gave James the space to get behind the defenders and then get the shot on goal, which he did very well with. But um, is there another one? Yes. Cross-ice passes, as effective as they are, they can be very easily countered if you've got good neutral zone defending like we discussed last week. So if you set up a box or a triangle moving back through the neutral zone, very easy to block cross, prevent players from wanting to do a cross-ice pass. Another way of countering it from a defender's perspective is not jumping in to try and intercept the pass, but, I, but sitting back and then applying pressure to the receiving player once they've received the puck. So as I said, again, last week, if the defending player hadn't tried to intercept the pass from Lewis and had instead sat back, let James receive the puck and then applied pressure on him using gap control and stick checking and all that, it would have made life for James a lot harder to then try and get a shot on goal. As it was, he didn't. The defender dived in. James received the puck easily skated past the other play defender who was heading in the opposite direction and then had a free shot on net, essentially, which he took advantage of. Very simple. It's very effective when used properly, but you need to know when best to use it because if you don't use it correctly, it can be intercepted and turned over. And then you can have a very quick turnaround and counterattack if you're not careful. <sighs> Offensive tactics, formations. So this is going to be looking at essentially player positioning when you're set up in the, in, the, in the opponent's zone. So there's a standard one where you've got your wingers sort of around the face-off dots, your two defenders against the blue line, and your center hanging around the middle. This is pretty standard formation. You'll see a lot of teams we play against using this sort of setup when they're attacking us both on power play and in five on five, if they have the puck possession in our, in our zone. Um, next one is the umbrella. The umbrella refers to the three players who are sort of hanging out around the blue line area. Um, this one is good. And anyone who watches Alexander Ovechkin will know that he hangs out on the left side very often waiting for a pass to come to him so he can one-time it from the, all the way over there. And he's probably got, what, about half his goals doing that, just hanging around there. Uh, the other good thing about the umbrella is that you've got two people in front of net. 
So you've got a bigger presence right in front of the net, picking up rebounds for blocking the goalie, making life just really horrible um, in for the defending team. Uh, and as I said, these are useful for when you're on power play and five on five. Um, moving on to the next formation, behind the net. Not so much official, but essentially a player hangs around behind the net with the puck and the other, other players are all spaced out roughly around the net like that. Again, you'll notice that because of the positioning of the players, the player with the puck behind the net can pass to all four players. Um, just a series of triangles there. It's very useful. Behind the net is very... Again, I, I keep referring back to our level, but our ability level, we're going to have a very wide ability range. And it's the same for every other team we play against. So if you have the puck behind the net, it is very confusing for less experienced defenders how to deal with that. Do they send one player around to get it? Do they send both defenders around to try and pinch them? Do the defenders just hold out by the posts? How do they deal with that? And then what do the other then the other players have to try and mark the other players at the same time. It's a very good way of getting a mismatch. Excuse me, going. And confusing players. It's For less experienced teams, it is very difficult to work out what to do. Personally, I'd prefer if the defenders hang on at the goalposts and don't dive in to try and take the puck off them. Let them sit there and put your stick in and keep trying to poke the stick out, put them off. Let your other players worry about the pass, passing lanes and you just let them sit there behind the net. They can't score there. If they try that stupid lacrosse move, then just cross-check them across the face as they come around. It's, it's pretty simple. But a lot of players, particularly when there's a lot of pressure on, they make decisions where they try and jump in and it can cause mismatches and opportunities for the attacking side. And finally, uh, overload, I think that's the name for it. I probably made that up in a dream or something weird. Essentially, it's more, although you're keeping a similar pentagon shape, you're shifting the play depending on which side the puck's on. So in this particular case, the puck is in the corner, this black dot up here. And so you've got one defender who's moved over closer to the boards. The winger has pushed up. The center has moved in towards the net and the other winger has come up a bit to help create the triangle again still between the three forwards. And the other far defender has moved across to the center of the ice. Um, it's again, this, this depends, this is more, requires a bit more practice and coordination between the attacking players because they need to move and flow around as the puck is being moved around the zone. Um, it causes, as you can see, an, a mismatch on that on the puck side. So if you're if that winger has the puck in the corner, you've essentially got all your players pretty much in the same quarter of the uh, well half of that zone has the puck. So it's a lot easier. You've got much smaller space to move the puck around in. But it also means you will probably have more players in that area because they will still have another player hanging out wide-ish and trying to come in. And they'll have to react to how your team moves. And the idea is that you're like a blob that moves around the zone, overloading the side that you're on, applying more pressure. Uh, that's not right. Okay, so now we're going to go... Sorry, first of all, that's all, all of the tactic stuff. Are there any questions? Nope. Cool. So Northumbria game. This is an example of one of the goals that they scored. Whether they planned it or not, it seems unlikely. It was just more opportunistic. But essentially, they combined three of the previous tactics we've discussed in order to score the goal. So first of all, they did a cross ice pass, which our defender jumped in and missed it. So their player then got the puck and then moved on down the board. Our other defender had to come over to try and compensate. The next, and it starts to get a bit busy on here now, 
the other two forwards from Northumbria then crashed the net as the other player started to move in towards the side of the net. All of our players that were now back checking to try and compensate. However, because of the applied pressure and the fact they were crashing the net, we overcompensated. And so when their two defenders came in over the blue line, they were both completely unmarked by our wingers who due to the mismatches and disorganization of the crash, the net had got sucked into the play. One of their players at this was actually after a couple of seconds of the puck bouncing around. I think Cara made a couple of saves in that particular part. One of their players popped it out to the defender who came in top, top of the slot with the puck and shot in and scored the goal. And it looks very messy on here, but when you break it down, they just followed three simple strategies, which all worked very well and completely took us apart. Um, there, are way, there are ways, and looking at the strategies that we did last week, there are ways we could have shut this down at each stage. So in the first stage, if we had had the neutral zone defending box or triangle, like we discussed, that would have shut it down. Or if the defender hadn't jumped in, um, in the crash the net sequence, the a little harder to directly affect it, but we could have allowed our players not to not to not allow all five of our players to get sucked into the play, because that's essentially what killed us was leaving two unmarked players at the, at our blue line. And I, funnily enough, the last the last phase is something we never did against Northumbria or Bradford or the Beagles, for example. There were a number of occasions where something that we did sucked in all of their defending players. So all five of their players were bunched up in front of the net. And on not a single occasion did anyone consider passing the puck out to the defenders who were free on the blue line. So, and it it was actually watching because I've I've watched each of the matches about four or five times each, and it was watching this particular goal three or four times, which made me want to do these presentations because we were meant to be going through them the two weeks before nationals after that Northumbria game, but because of Rambo's COVID conspiracy, we were unable to do it, and so now we're talking about it now. Um, any particular questions about that example? Or anything anyone wants to say? Like, sorry, coach, we, we did bad. Won't do it again, something like that, no? Okay. So conclusion, practice short shortens offensive decision-making time. Again, we're coming back to the reaction time and the decision-making times and giving ourselves that split second advantage. Be aware of movements off the puck to optimize options. This is to, again, talking back to when you're trying to find, find what position you're meant to be in on the ice when attacking, look at your teammates and assess in terms of providing options for our pack puck carrier, where would be the best place to be? Visualize the triangles as you're, try, as you're trying to find a position room for creativity so we don't just have to sit we don't just have to do the strategies i've made here these are all just basic foundations these are basic strategies which can be developed by yourselves if there's if i don't know it, let's say the three pigeons are all on a forward line together and they all think they can do a particularly fancy weaving move that they've made up in their heads or they practiced on NHL 21 or something and they can do that that's great it's you're not rigidly stuck to the same thing and I don't I would never want all of you as a team to strictly do what I say I mean obviously do what I say but if I tell you to do a passing and moving play up the ice it doesn't strictly have to be a weave it doesn't strictly have to be Phil's magnificent passing move 101 it can be any old crap that you make up as long as it works. And if you think critically about this, you can be as creative as you like with these things. Even 
something as rudimentary as crash the net or dump and chase. The more we practice it, the more we get these fundamentals down, the more we can start being creative with these things. And yeah, it's it's fun. You don't I don't want a team of players who just do move in exactly the way I tell them to, because I'm not the best ice hockey player on, in the world. I'm not the best ice hockey coach in the world. I don't know everything. And I'm certainly not the most creative person in the world. So it's also more fun as well if you practice these things. So if someone wants to do a lacrosse move to get around a player, fucking do it. If you do it, great. If you don't lose the puck and they score a goal off it, then I'll give you shit for it. But it's I, I'd much rather you have fun and make mistakes than follow everything I say like robots and just do okay. <laughs> uh, creating space and mismatches. This is the key part of offensive strategies is to create space for yourself, for the player receiving a pass or for the puck carrier and causing mismatches between players in terms of numbers. If you can get three against twos, two on ones, five on fours, even when there's five on five on the ice, then you create opportunities for yourselves. You create space, you give yourself more time to act, to assess situations. Again, you have more options. And that's that's all this, all this is, is just creating options for yourselves to be able to attack more effectively. Communication is key. You need, um, I said this last week, no more stick tapping if you want the puck. If you want the puck, you've got to fucking shout for it. You've got to scream. You've got to go, here, puck, now. You've got to let them know where you are. You've got to let them know that you're available to receive the puck. Everyone slaps their sticks on the ice. So just tapping your stick on the ice is just going to sound like everyone else. So communication is key, particularly when it comes to coordinating team strategies. It, the same for the strategies last week. It's the same for the strategies this week. If going back to the Northumbria strategy, this last pass back to the defender, if the defenders hadn't shouted to let the forwards know that they were completely free for space, the forward probably wouldn't have passed because the forwards there with the puck in front of the net, everyone's instinct is just to get the puck on the net as quickly as they can or to pass to someone else who's in a slightly better position. Unless the defender is screaming bloody murder to let them know they're completely free, you can't expect the forward to just pop the pass out there. That would just seem crazy. So it's important to make sure that you're communicating, letting know, letting people know where you are, letting, you know, letting them know if you're free, letting them know if you're not free. If you are free and then suddenly someone comes to mark you, you need to communicate that you are no longer available to receive a pass. Um, we're very quiet on the ice. Um, and I said this last week, we're very quiet on the ice, which is amazing because we're so bloody loud in the changing rooms. But we need to bring, bring that volume onto the ice. We need, I know there's this feeling that, oh, if I reveal that I'm free for a pass and I'm open, I'm revealing it to the other team. But if we train these drills and we train communication, people on our side will react quicker than they will to realizing that someone is free. And we will get that split second head start that we need. Um, same as last week, no one of these approaches is better or worse than the other. Some of them will work in some situations. Some of them won't work in others. Dump and chase would be great. But if we're up against a team that is faster, more experienced and stronger than us, dump and chase is not going to be the best way to go. They'll out outpace us on the chase. They'll beat us physically along the boards. They might know what to do if a team uses a dump and chase against them so that, but on the other hand they might be really crap at position play so something like a weave or some other passing move or a drop pass something to clog up the slot is more effective but it doesn't mean it's better or worse they're just different weapons to use everyone attacks so same as the principle last week or I said everyone defends and everyone back checks, everyone attacks. And 
although yes we do have forwards and defenders when it comes to doing these drills and practicing i want us all to just be five attackers and five defenders on the ice there's no distinction essentially and i know there has to be some distinction for setting up some formations and some particular plays but i would like every player ideally to know what they need to do if they are in a partic particular position because some of the things like the overlap pass on the tight turns you've you'll find yourself with a defender attacking with two forwards and a forward is suddenly now on the blue line looking for a, a slap shot from the point these players need to know what to do when they're in these positions and ice hockey is a crazy sport sometimes you will find defenders defenders getting a breakaway or a forward being the last line of defense and it's important that everyone at least to a fundamental level knows what it is they need to do because when you get a player not in the right position that's when you get the mismatches and the mistakes and conversely you get the opportunities uh, so if everyone has a basic understanding of what to do if they're in any position we reduce the opportunities the opponents have if they catch one of us out of position and that's the sort of mentality i want us to think of going forward and that is the end of my presentation please like and subscribe and hit the notifications button uh does anyone have any questions no um other than um than that was really really uh, really in, uh, informative, Phil. So, so, so thanks for that. I learned a lot. Thank you. Um, anyone else? Anyone? Questions? Anything they want to add? Something I missed or something they think that might be useful? I think that's, uh, I think it's good that we at least have like a basic tactical understanding of things because I can attest that with Beagles, we barely received any kind of tactical instruction uh, outside of actual on ice things. Uh, and I think that was way better explained than I had before. So being, being got to repair means that we're going to be in a position to make other teams. Foolish. Yeah. And it's, I mean, it's one of the things I wanted to make sure when I did start coaching a team again was making sure that people had the opportunity to learn the basic strategies and things like that. Cause unless you're exposed to ice hockey a lot of the time, which with a lot of beginners, you're not exposed to it a lot of the time. The only exposure you'll have to hockey is the hour that you're playing each week at a training session. So there's no way you're going to know all these particular strategies unless you go away and do research, which again, you, you can't always expect everyone to go away and do their own research and know what all these things are. Thanks, Lauren. See you around. Um, yeah, so it's, and I know a lot of rec teams don't do this. You, you turn up and I've, I've played for several rec teams over the years. You turn up, they just expect you to know these things and no one ever explains it to you. And if you don't know it, then you're just a crap hockey player. And half the time that's because they haven't actually got a dedicated coach. They've just got the best player on the team or the most Canadian player on the team shouting orders around. Um, which was the case I had at Cardiff. Um, it literally was, who's the most Canadian? Right, okay, you, you call the shots. And that, that was how it worked. Um, we did all right. We, we won a division title. But, <laughs> but yeah, no one... In the 20 years I've been playing, no one has ever sat down and gone, look, this is where players need to be. These are the types of things that players do. This is how formations work. This is how you set up. This is how you attack, things like that. And it's always bugged me that that's never happened. So I always wanted to make sure when I was coaching my own team that I at least had these things here so that people could understand the very basics. Anything else? Uh, no, I mean, it was a really good presentation. Are we going to get like a playbook near the uh, start of the season? Oh, yeah. I like, like that idea. Or like stuff, like, like not even like a physical book but like kind of like just a list of plays that we like practice in practice to use in games 
I, w- I was going to do one, but that was more for me to develop drills. But I suppose, yeah, I can yeah. put one together for the players as well. Is that way you it's... can look over it just before a game and stuff. Yeah. Cheers. Yeah, I was yeah, I was, I was going to do it for myself to help help me with training and that. But yeah, it'd be useful for matches and for the players as well. Yeah, I'll I'll do that. I'll try and make it a little neater. Some of the diagrams I did in here. <laughs> We're going to run any tactical stuff about like uh, power plays or penalty kills specifically. Or I think we did. If you were here, Drew, last week, we, we did power, power plays and penalty kills. Yeah, we did. I mean, like in terms of, uh, I guess we did. Sorry, I just, I, I forgot. <laughs> <laughs> well, the way, I mean, the, the way I see it, at the, at the moment, I try to keep things as basic as possible, which is why I don't go into the details of shooting or how to be the best stick hander in the world, because I'm, I'm never going to be. But when it comes to power plays, just play like you do five on five. And you'll find if we're following the same principles as we've been discussing today, you're going to find yourself with even more space and even more opportunities to make passes and afford shooting lanes. So because of week to week I, I would normally have such limited time with everyone i wouldn't want to spend too much time on how to set up the perfect power play i'd rather just have five players playing as they would against five players and worry more about penalty killing because that is a different situation which requires different thinking um but yeah it's uh if anyone else can think of other stuff then maybe we can put another presentation together later on on some other topics I'll put together a playbook before next season starts as well um, and Ollie can we get can you put this up, video up on Facebook like you did last yeah. week yeah I'll upload that um, straight away. And can we get them on the Facebook on the YouTube channel as well yeah I just need the uh, the video file I could not download it something changed in the program I used it's oh. Right. Yeah. I'll, I'll send that just to like, you, Callie, then. Yeah, just send him yeah. an email or just drop in the stags email. I can take the stag from the stags. Oh, See yeah, if we cool. can get 10 likes on the video. <laughs> <laughs> no, nah, this would be uh, really good. Yeah, like, the only thing, are we ever going to like maybe touch on, because it's not really offense or defense, it's more like middle 